that I believe God has put on my heart. So the title of this message is going to be called The Journey, Trust the Process. So what do I mean by trust the process? Well, this concept, this inspiration for the title of um, this message came from um, the NBA, <laughs> the National Basketball Association. Okay, that's a bit random. Why is it, what, what, where, 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 where's the link? Okay, let me explain. So it's typical in the NBA for um, young players, especially young prospects that get um, drafted or get picked by teams in the NBA to perform well. There's a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure from themselves, a lot of pressure from them, from their organisations or their teams to perform, a lot of pressure from fans to perform. Um, there is just a lot um, depending on you because there's a level of expectation. There's a level of expectation that you're going to perform um, in such a way that you performed in the past and um, when you're at that college and university level. And there's an expectation that you're going to improve and become the face of a franchise, particularly for those who were the top prospects um, in their draft class. So a lot of, but unfortunately, a lot of the time what happens with um, these players, and this is not just in NBA, this is, you know, in um, bas baseball and in NFL and American football as well, top prospects tend to, or a lot of the time, tend to um, what we use the term a uh, bust or flop like they, they don't perform as well as they were expected to and what happens is because they don't perform to the level they were expected to or they weren't or they did not um, align with kind of the plan or the expectation the team will start to lose faith in them and then what happens over time is that maybe potentially this team <clears throat> might trade this player to another team because they've they've completely given up on them. They said that we don't have time for you anymore. Um, we don't trust you. We don't believe that you can contribute to this team um, like we initially thought you could. Or they might just completely release them from their contract so they're not even under professional contract anymore. And um, what I want to say to you, where, where is this link? What does this have to do with um, my process, with our processes, with our plans? God will never release you like he would in um, the NBA. Your process is not over, point number one. Your process is not over. God will not give up on you like um, humans or people might give up on you. You have a plan. You have a purpose. It says in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It does not matter where you were, or where you are now, God will still use you. The call of God on your life will not go away. He has a purpose. He has a plan for you, a process for you, that he wants to take you through step by step in his plan that he wants to um, push you forward to um, fulfill the purpose that he made you originally to do. Because there is one purpose in your life. And, there's, and you're the only person in this world who can achieve that purpose. I believe that from the bottom of my heart, that all of us, we have a purpose that only we can achieve. It says in the Bible, you know, God made us. He knit us in our mother's womb. He knew us in the days before that. Our names were written in this book. Each and every day was written in his book. It talks about also in Psalms. God has a plan and a purpose for you. And it doesn't matter how much you might have messed up in the past. A lot of the time, um, some of us might think, oh, I'm too old to be used by God if, um, by God anymore. Or, you know, oh, I've strayed away too far from God to be used by him anymore. Or I've sinned too much. I've hurt too many people to be used by God anymore. Look at the Bible. <laughs> Literally, each and every single person, the majority of the people in the Bible did some madness, okay? We have Moses, he killed a man. I'm sure most of you guys have not killed somebody before. Or we look at Joseph, you know, someone who was extremely cocky, had was extremely selfish and had a, bad, a big, big, big ego. Or, you know, we look at um, even um, David in the Bible. Um, amazing. He was called a man after God's own heart, but he went out of his way to kill someone, take his wife and make, to take his, that, that person's wife and make um, her his own. That's really twisted. God uses twisted people. God uses messed up people. Um, and no matter what their past is, your past does not matter because God does not see your past. God does not see your circumstances. 
God does not see what you have not done because he doesn't base his trust on the things of the past. But he has belief. He is rooted for you and he believes that the plan that he wants you to carry out will still be fulfilled if you just partner with him and trust him in, in the process. Jeremiah 29 11. This is a, a scripture that so many people know. It's a big one. And it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. The plans that God has for you are always good. They are always to prosper you. There's always something that you can contribute in your life. It is never over. It is never too late. Answer the call of God now rather than later. Don't be like Jonah who delayed it, who ran away out of fear, but instead focus on it and go towards it. And maybe you guys might be saying, oh man, like I tried, but God wasn't there for me. Or I don't even believe in God. He doesn't have a plan. He doesn't have a purpose for me. You know, where was he when um, my nan died? Where was he when my, my brother died? Where was he in my divorce? Where was he in my relationships that always were destructive? Where was, where was he when I, when I got, um, you know, um, assaulted? Or, you know, fill in the gap. Where, where was God when this bad circumstance happened to you? God doesn't, God doesn't base the call upon your circumstances. That's not what it's about. And in those circumstances that, that he doesn't necessarily even ordain, because not every circumstance, not every bad decision is from him. He won't necessarily, you know, um, ordain or create your circumstance, but he can use that circumstance that you are in to shape you. A lot of the time, a lot of the circumstances that we're in are based on our own accord. They're based on decisions that we have made. And a lot of the time are not in line with the word of God. But the thought that God is so good because he can still use the circumstance that you are in to shape you into the person you are going to be. A lot of the time we go through a trial, we go through a tribulation, whether you know that is you know something natural that happened, like someone passing away. Maybe it's a divorce, that was not part of the plan. Maybe it was, you know, I had a miscarriage, that wasn't part of the plan. Like God will use you, God will use your situation and your trial and your tribulation to encourage you, to build you up. It says in James 1, verse 2 to 3, consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance and that comes on to point number two trials in the process provide opportunities for growth so it's crazy but that 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 verse that i just said you know consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds like that's crazy because I don't know about you, but I don't feel joyful when I go through a trial or I go through a struggle or I go through a tribulation, whatever that might be, whether that's something external or something internal from me, me myself within. I'm not having joy. I don't have joy in it. I, I want to get out of it. And you know, a lot of the time, a lot of us, we pray, we pray to God, God, here I am, use me, use me in a mighty way. All of us want to be used by God in a mighty, mighty way. But when it comes to where, you know, stuff starts getting uncomfortable, when it starts coming to um, a situation, you know, which we don't like or a situation where, you know, um, it seems like there is no reason to worship. There's no reason to praise God, to trust God. That's when our true colours show. Our true colours show not when we are, you know, on top of the mountain, when, you know, we're, we're, we're doing good in life. But the true colours of our, of our faith, our true, true faith comes in the valley. It comes when we are going through trials and tribulations. And, you know... I've learned that over time, you know, there, there, there's been a lot of stuff that's kind of happened in my own life. And a lot, like I said, a lot of the time, you know, we, we, we ask God, God use us in a mighty way. And then a trial comes, a storm comes in our life. And, you know, we're like, oh, God, where are you? Where are you, God? Where are you at? And a lot of the time we can, we can um, forget about what God has done in the past. God has brought us out of so many different situations, so many scenarios where, you know, we have gone through something and he's always been with there um, from us. And from that process, from that refining period, we have bore more fruit because in a season of testing, in a season of refining, God wants to give us a new wine skin. He wants to um, trust us with more to take us to the next level. You, usually before the next level of promotion or the next level of trust or the next level of, um, you know, just um, like stuff God wants to give you to um, equip you with and to, and to trust you with, you're going to go through a, this period of testing, of refining. And usually this is super, super uncomfortable. And a lot of the time, <coughs> sorry, we do not want to be part of that or we don't want to engage in that. 
But when we grow in that situation, when we can have joy in that situation, when we know, when we can look at our, um, you know, our, our trials as, you know what, this is a, a time, this is tough, I hate it, it's horrible, but I know that God is in this situation right now. I know that God is working in this situation and how sweet it's going to be when I come out of this um, situation, when I come out of this circumstance. Um, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible can be found in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And basically it's the, um, the Apostle Paul and he's talking about how he's got this kind of thorn in his side. This thorn being, you know, like an infirmity, you know, like a physical impairment or, you know, you can even, you could even suggest, you know, that it was something that he struggled with. You know, a lot of us maybe in this um, life, we struggle with a certain part, like a certain sin or, uh, or we're particularly weak when it comes to a certain thing, you know, where we just feel weak and, you know, we don't have any strength in ourselves and we, and we, and we trip up. And this is what God um, said to Paul when Paul was begging, please take this thorn away from you. Please take this infirmity away from you. I don't want this anymore. Jesus said this, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I'd rather boast about my infirmities that power of God might rest upon me. Or again, to develop, it says, for my grace is sufficient for you. That's what Jesus says. For my grace is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, most glad I rather boast about my infirmities. Now that's Paul speaking. He wants to boast about his infirmities. That the power of God may rest upon me. So there's this weird oxymoron here. That there is power when I'm weak. How is there power when I am weak? That makes no sense. When we are weak. When we are going through the process, when we're going through the refining part of the process, we have to, in, in, in this period of time, that's when we need to seek refuge in the Lord. That's when we need to say, God, I can't do this in my own strength, not by might, not by power, by the Holy Spirit, by God's power that resides upon us. We are able to carry out um, the task. We are able to push through that tough, tough season, that tough, tough circumstance. And through that um, relying on God, relying on Jesus to pull us through, we are made stronger and we have bore more fruit. We grow in joy we grow in love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control these are the fruits of the spirit that, we, that can be found in galatians chapter 5 um, verse 21 or 22 or 23 i believe we can grow in this time so when you are going through a trial um, when you're going through a tribulation during your process during your purpose during your walk with christ it is an opportunity for you to be able to grow to grow bear fruit and know as well and you can have confidence you know it says have joy in a trial that doesn't make any sense but you know when we know this when we can understand this in our head that god is using the situation to help us to grow we can be like god i don't feel like it right now but i'm going to worship you i'm going to praise you because i know that in this circumstance in this situation you are going to make me something better you're finding me into a better product and I'm going to be able Lord Father to you know make an impact on, on lots of people's lives because you know what's crazy as well that that situation that trial that you go through the fruit that you bear from that whilst it's a testimony for you it's a testimony for other people as well that's crazy it's a testimony for other people as well because people are going to see yo how did you come through that trial how did you come through that tribulation by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit and people will start to their faith will start to go like oh, you know if, if, if God did that for them he can do that for me you know yeah I'm going through this tough time right now but just as he went through that tough time he came through and, and look what and look at him he's thriving look at her she she is thriving in life how because God was in the process and we trusted in the Holy Spirit and not in ourselves and this links on to my third point during the process that trust God in the process rather than trusting in yourself. Trust in the power of the Holy Spirit rather than your own strength. Trusting God means we need to have faith. And faith is what makes God happy. Faith is what pleases God because faith is the, the craziest thing, you know, because it's, it's what you do not see. It says in Hebrews 11, 1, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen or not seen but you know when we talk about hope in the world hope is you know something that you know it, it's quite a it seems like quite a weak term you know it's quite almost um wishy-washy oh yeah i'm hoping that you know um if you're a kid like i'm hoping that my mom is gonna get me a, a ps4 you know for for christmas or you know i'm hoping that i'm gonna be able to get through this exam that i have or i'm hoping that i'm gonna get this job but actually that that word hope actually means confident expectation 
so, so, so when we put our hope in God, when we put our hope that God's got a plan and his plans are above um, our plan and his ways are higher than our ways, <clears throat> that um, we are confidently expecting for God to move in that situation, for God to move in this period of time. We, when we have hope in God, it, it's something that we put our entire trust in. And this is the difference between um, like religion and faith. Religion is the knowledge of it. It's the head knowledge. It's, you know, um, we do, I, I, I know of it, but I, I still don't apply it. That, that's the same with the word of God, the same with the Bible. A lot of the time we can read it and we can say, that's good. Or a lot of the time we can be in church and be like, amen, pastor, that's so good. Or we can be watching a sermon online and be like, preach it, pastor. Or be like, man, that's so good. But are you going out and doing it? Are you going out and doing the word of God? You know, are, are, are you spreading the love? The pe are you being the salt and the light to the earth, as it talks about in Matthew? The people know that you're saved. Are you, are you going out and making disciples of all nations? You know, are you going out um, and praying for healing for people on the sick? Are you believing for the miraculous? Because God will move in that, but we need to step out in faith. We need to walk in the word of God. A lot of people say knowledge is power. If, if I'm if I am uh, assuming that knowledge is power, that means if I know the Bible in my head, if I know the word of God in my head, um, that means that I'm going to succeed. That means that I I'm going to do well. But that is not correct. Knowledge is not power. Let me let me rephrase it. Applied knowledge is power. When we partner with God and actually do what he says, that's what faith is. Because when you believe something, you're going to do it. You know, when you really believe it in your heart instead of your head, you're going to go out and do it. And this can be very, very, very difficult, very uncomfortable for us. And this is how we grow out of our comfort zone by we start doing what the word of God says. Um, I, have, I have a bit of a testimony for this. Um, for example... So um, when I was in university, I really, especially when I was, you know, um, you know, in kind of my church group and in my small group, there was this um, um, activity that we had to do, which was kind of, you know, a quick five minute presentation in a group as well, just talking about the concept of love in the Bible. And I was like, I, I don't know, this is when I was very, very like, ah, uh, you know, I, I can't read anything from the Bible. I can't explain the Bible. I don't understand the Bible. The Bible doesn't make sense. It's a hard, it's a hard book. I can't understand it. Like, you know, why would God write something that makes no sense? Um, <laughs> do you get me? So I, I didn't have faith um, in that. And then I tried, I tried, the presentation came, it came to my point and I just stuttered. I stuttered. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't process anything. I couldn't, you know, articulate it or present it in a way that people would be able to um, understand. And I, I flopped. And from that point on, I believed the lie that I'll never, ever, ever be able to understand the Bible. I'll never be able to um, walk in the word of God, yet alone even teach the word of God. <laughs> God is funny because you know what he probably said in that point? Ha <laughs> ha! Like, look at what I am doing now. Look at where I'm at now. If you were going to tell me two years down the line, I was going to be working at a church, I would say you lot are crazy. If you're going to tell me walking down the line that I was going to be being able to talk, have the opportunity and um, the grace to be able to talk to you guys um, today and, and and however in the future, in the past, I would say you're crazy because I believe the lie that I could not do it. But guess what? Where I was weak, where I didn't have faith in myself, where I didn't believe I could do it, in my weakness, God made me strong. Because I have to, every single time I speak, every time I lead my life group, every single time I speak in front of anyone, I need to walk forward and trust in the power of the Holy Spirit and trust that it's not by power, not my own power, not by might, not by physical might, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. That is what we need to trust into because when we try, when we are weak, that, that gives more glory for God to be shown in our process. No matter what we are going through, may, maybe it's an affliction you have. Maybe you're struggling with, you know, a sin like be, being an alcoholic or maybe addicted to pornography or um, being, I don't know, um, anger management or something where you really, really struggle with or something that you find weak. You can find strength in that by focusing on the Holy Spirit and he will make you strong. And when someone will say, how did you manage to overcome that? You'll say, it was God. It was the Holy Spirit. There was nothing else. That is what I love about that, you know, and we need to boast about these things. And when we are weak, we are made strong. And my last point is this. Obedience and patience are the keys that will, pro that will, that will progress you in your process. So in your, progress, in, your, in your process to progress, we need obedience and we need patience. 
Um, so I'm just quickly gonna um, summarize this story. Um, it's about this guy called um, Saul. So this is a king called Saul. Many of you guys might be aware he can be found in the stories of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. Now basically, um, Saul was anointed as a king out of nowhere. He was this humble guy who, you know, he came from the smallest tribe in the whole of Israel. And God has said, this is who I'm going to pick to be king. And this is what God said to Samuel and all the P, um, sorry, to Saul and Samuel, who was a prophet who basically said to Saul, you're going to be king. This is what he said in 1 Samuel 12, verse 14 to 15. Now, therefore, here is a king who you have chosen and whom you have desired. Take note that the Lord has set a king over you. And this is it. If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. However, if you do not obey the voice of God, but rebel, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be set against you as it was set against your fathers. You know, listen to me and do what I say pretty much, you know, um, succeed and you'll listen to me. If you disobey me, it's not going to work. It's not it's not going to happen to you. And I, I and I'm not going to be able to be in your situation further down the line. Um, so this has been spoken. So th this has happened. I'm still talking about the Bible right here. So um, this word has been spoken to this guy called Saul. Yet, knowing this, that he has to be obedient. He goes, he like, um, further down the line, um, this prophet guy, Samuel, says, okay, so this is what's going to happen to you. A prophet was someone who could receive the, um, the, the voice of God and would tell him the things that were going to happen, that what God was saying to him. And basically, the, the guy who was receiving the word from the prophet, this being Saul, should have done what was told of him because it was the word of God. So Samuel basically said, go to this place, wait seven days, um, I'm going to come, this is Samuel now, he said, I'm going to come to where you're at Saul, I'm going to perform this sacrifice, and then basically you're going to win the war. I'm not going to go into it, but basically that's the context. Um, so, so knowing this, Saul was like, okay, cool. So it gets to the situation, time passes, it gets to the situation where Saul is in this place called Gilgal. But Saul, Saul doesn't do what he was told. He had a clear instruction from God, do this, and this is what's going to happen. You're going to win the war. But Saul was told to wait seven days to wait for Samuel. And literally, the second it hit the seventh day, the second it hit the seventh day, Saul lost it, and then he ended up doing the sacrifice himself and disobeying the word of God. Now, this is what it says in um, 1 Samuel 13, and I'm reading from verse 8 to 14. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said to him, Bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. Um, further down the line, um, basically um, Samuel says, What have you done? Why have you done this? Why have you disobeyed the word of God? And Saul says, when I saw the people were scattering from me, that being his soldiers, and that you did not come within the days appointed. So when he didn't come within Saul's perception of um, his time, the Philistines gathered together. Those were the enemies in the war that um, they were facing against, the Israelites versus the Philistines, gathered together at um, this place called Michmash. Then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal. I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and made a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you've done foolishly, you've not connect, um, kept the command of the Lord your God, which, ha which he has commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. That is important. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept what the word of God commanded. God wants us to be men and women after God's own heart. And that means we need to be obedient to the word of God. So what quick two lessons can we learn from, um, you know, the mistake that Saul made um, from Samuel? And we can look at this in, from verse 8, where it said, Then he waited seven days, according to the time set by Samuel, but, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And when the people were scattered from him, so Saul said, Bring me the burnt offering, etc., etc. So what, we can, what lessons we can learn from Saul not to partake in is, uh, number one, Trust in God's timing, not our own timing. 
A lot of the time in the process, in our plan, you know, we want it to be according to our plan. You know, we want to, we want, you know, to be married by a certain time, to have this job by a certain time, to have this at this time, to have that at this time, etc, etc. But that's according to our plan and not God's plan. And we can get impatient and we can start going out and, you know, doing st and, and start making decisions outside of the word of God, which is not in his plan, and not in his process. The second um, point that I want to make is you should not rush your decisions based on fear of man. Just like Saul, he saw his soldiers got scared, so he reacted and he made the sacrifice. But if Saul was obedient to the word of God, despite looking around at his atmosphere um, situation, despite looking around at his environment where lots of people, and you know, living in the secular environment as well, where people say success is money, success is power, success is accolades, success is this, success is that, and you should have achieved this by a certain age. That that that's when you start to fear man more, and you're like, oh man, I need I need to get on these guys' level. But God has a plan for us, and we need to obey Him. We need to be obedient to Him and his word because his plan is greater than our plan and then our kingdom will be established because we are faithful to God's word so in conclusion Romans 8 28 says this and we know all things work together for those who love God those who are according those who are called according to his purpose it's his purpose guys and it's his plan and we need to trust him and be obedient to him. So I'm just going to pray um, right now um, for all of us. And then I'm going to pray for those of who might be watching who are like, you know, I don't know who God is, but, you know, I want to know him. I want to know him bad. Let me start. Lord Father, we thank you for all that you're doing in this world. Lord God, we thank you for all that you're doing in our lives individually. And Lord, we trust you. We trust your process. We trust your plan. We trust each and every step of um, of the plan that you have for us, Lord God. And we just and we, we pray, Lord Father, that where we might have baby faith, Lord, for where we don't have the, that faith um, naturally, Lord Father, please give us that faith because we trust you. We believe you, Lord Father, that we want to walk according to your will, according to your path, Lord Father. No, how, no matter how long it takes, Lord, help us to be patient in the process, Lord Father, because we know that you're going to bring everything into fruition according to your plan. And I just want to pray for you guys right now who maybe don't know God and you and you really want to accept Jesus into, into your life right now. Or maybe you're like, I still don't know. I, st I still don't know, um, you know, if this is all real or not. I would say challenge him. What have you got to lose? What, what have you got to lose um, by challenging God that? And I guarantee you would be the best decision of your life. So repeat this prayer after me and, and see God change your life. Lord God, I'm sorry that I've messed up in the past. I'm sorry for the way I've sinned. I'm sorry, Lord God, that, you know, I wasn't um, walking according to your will um, for everything that um, you had for me, Lord God. And I was living life on my own accord, doing X, doing Y, and not following the, um, your word and your will. But Lord God, I want you now. I want to know you more. And, you know, I'm still not sure if this is um, real. God, but I want to walk according to your plan and according to your purpose because Lord Father I realize that by walking in your plan and walking in the purpose you have for me I'm, I'm going to be able to um, fulfill my purpose in life and glorify you Lord Father and that is where you know my fulfillment will come from and my strength will come from so Lord God I just pray Lord God that you are stirring up hearts right now Lord Father that these everyone who has um, said this prayer Lord Father will know you so personally in Jesus name I pray amen so guys, that's all I have for you. I hope that it was edifying and it helped you and that you will enjoy the rest of your evening.